We have been all around the country, but on today's episode, it's our first time in the Tumba Rumba wine region, located in the Snowy Mountains, famous for their cool climate wines. I'm Lee, and welcome to the Cellar Door. We've made our way to Tumbarumba, nestled along the western edges of the Snowy Mountains and situated almost halfway between Melbourne and Sydney. This emerging cool climate wine region was one of the last places left to visit on our bucket list and today we're getting a chance to check in on two local wineries making a name for themselves in the area. First, I'm popping in to see Tim at Allegiance Wines. With over 20 years of industry experience, Tim established Allegiance Wines just over 10 years ago, and he picked a perfect spot to do it. Tim, thank you so much for having us here with you at Allegiance Wines. Can you please tell us a little bit about your story, your history, and how the brand started? Allegiance is a fairly short story, so we're very new. Mm -hmm. um, the brand started in 2014 but we've had a family wine business since 2009. So we've been making, selling and wholesaling wines for the last 13 odd years. We came to it backwards in the sense that most people buy a vineyard, make wines, release a brand. Mm -hmm. Well, we released a brand, buy wines and then bought a vineyard. Great. But it was good that way because we already had established ourselves in the market. So it wasn't that much harder for us to get the distributions you need to have a profitable wine brand, mm -hmm. which is half the battle yeah. in such a crowded market. And can you tell us a little bit about your property here? Yeah, it's a 25 uh, hectare property with about eight hectares under vine. Uh, it's predominantly Pinot Gris and Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. uh, we also saw some Sab Blanc and Pinot Noir from a vineyard just over the hill. Yeah. So we make five different uh, Tumbarumba local wines. In the valley floor, in the Manus Valley, just outside of the township of Tumbarumba, so we've got really fertile soils here, but we're also the most frost prone. And being in the Snowy Mountains, <laughs> that's one of the big risks. Yeah. Having never visited this part of the country before, I was keen to find out just how the Snowy Mountains differ from other wine growing regions. It's the coldest viticultural region on mainland Australia. So nice. only Tasmania has colder vineyards than us. Mm -hmm. We're one of the lower vineyards, so we're only about 530 metres, but they go way higher, up past 800. That cool climate leads you to those real elegant, uh, varietal expressions, particularly with Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, but a lot of the um, uh, newer alternate varieties are coming through now, mm -hmm. so we're seeing stuff like you know, Gamay and Alberino, etc., which is really exciting for the region to, to develop into mm -hmm. those new varietals. Tim, you have a point of difference with a particular grape that you make two wines out of, is that correct? Yeah, it's a little bit unusual. Most yeah. people choose one side of the style equation mm -hmm. and go with it, but what you're referring to there is our Pinot Gris, mm -hmm. um, and we make both a Gris and a Grigio. Mm -hmm. And it's not surprising that a lot of consumers don't actually know that Pinot Grigio and Pinot Gris come from yep. the same grape, mm -hmm. um, and it, they're simply just made in the, uh, the styles of the origins in Europe, so mm -hmm. the Grigio being Italian and the Gris being French. Could you educate me uh -huh. and, uh, Absolutely. and let me taste these two? Well, we need to start here. Sure. <laughs> so this is our Emily Jane Pinot Grigio. Mm -hmm. So going with the Italian style, I might join you with this. Please do. The Italians go for a zesty, fruity, zingy style mm -hmm. and they do it by 
uh, excellent levels of natural acidity. So in the winery, uh, we do a cold ferment mm -hmm. that locks in the acidity and gives it that zing and zest. And I, I like to describe this as a bit of a party wine because it's a lot of fun and fruit. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the palate, it gives you that uh, extra you know, natural tingly texture. Uh, scarily easy to drink. Okay. And occasion wise, is it still goes quite well with food, but it's for me, it's a wine to enjoy with good friends. Standing on a balcony. Bit. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Overlooking the vineyard, giving it a swirl. Very nice. So have a smell first, mm -hmm. and hopefully mm -hmm. you'll get some luscious fruit yeah. uh, on the nose there. It's the most like common some. descriptor for Grigio and Gris is nashy pear and a yeah. little bit of apple and those types of things. Uh, whereas on the palate, mm. you, do you? Get that acidity. Yeah. It really grabs mm. you, grabs the tongue, rolls around yeah. the mouth, and nice, nice clean finish. Mm. A lot of times with our wines, we start with the finish. Um, there's nothing more disappointing than smelling a great wine, tasting it, oh, and then right at the end, it you gets go, it. oh, what happened there? <laughs> so, uh, one of the most important things for us is to make sure that the finish is nice okay. and clean. And hopefully, that Grigio does that. It very much so does. Big fan of the Pinot Grigio. Now for the Thomas James Pinot Gris. So you might not, colour wise it's probably going to be very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, nose wise you'll still pick up that pear and apple stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but it will be right on the palate which should hopefully be the difference. Yeah. And uh, a French Pinot Gris will be rich, round and full. Yeah. Uh, quite a good food wine. Um, and then hopefully it'll fill that whole palette, whereas the Grigio will be that zesty bang, whereas the you'll get a lot more lingering and right. length, hopefully, with the grease. So let's have a try mm -hmm. that. Mm. Mm, I like that. Mm. Well, the most important thing for us in all of this as you can see a difference. Yes, definite difference. Oh, fantastic. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. if it was the same, we'd failed miserably. Okay. <laughs> uh, and that's what we're looking for, those two contrasting styles. And these were picked on the same night and uh, crushed, but then sent to the separate fermentation. Okay. So the, the Gris actually did go to a warm ferment mm -hmm. with actually a touch of French oak, which is very unusual in a Gris, but not for flavour, just for texture. Right. So we're looking, you said that roundish from fill the palate out. What I love to Tim about your wines is um, the stories that go along with them. So you know your different wines have you know a, a person of importance um, either in your life or someone in your family or um, someone linked to each wine. Because our brand is quite young we don't have hundred years of history to, mm -hmm. to rely upon so um, what's more important for people when we're telling our about our wines is they want to know the stories uh, behind the labels, what drove us to do it. And so this is our Coonawarra Cabernet. Mm -hmm. um, we've been making this one for about 10 vintages now. And uh, we have a great relationship with a, a grower and a winemaker in, in Coonawarra. Um, the foreman is named in honour of my father. So he was the foreman shipwright mm -hmm. at Ballina Slipway for 30 odd years where I grew up uh -huh. and I pretty much grew up in that slipway so pulling boats on and off and I was the annoying little kid running around my father used to say the uh, was his favorite saying was the iron men who built the timber ships yeah. because he used to build timber yeah. ships of course mm -hmm. <laughs> but since then uh, you know, he worked on famous ships like the uh, South Stain, Manly Ferry, yeah. and the MV Crite, the World War II infiltrator um, so when he passed away uh, and I dedicated a wine to him, it quickly became the most important wine in my range. Not the most expensive yeah. or the fanciest, but mm -hmm. it's the one I had to get right every yeah. time. Yeah. Because uh, if I didn't, then I'd be in trouble with my late father. Yeah. For me, we and for the family, we don't drink the foreman, we drink a bottle of dad or granddad yeah. or stuff because it's it just gives us that connection. Yeah. And 
with all our story wines, so that some of them are related to other people that aren't in the family, but obviously people have had an impact on me. Yeah. Um, we always work closely with the family to make sure that the dedication's appropriate and okay. they're happy with it. But mm -hmm. everybody just loves the fact they've got a way to remember their loved one. Yeah. And this is the way I remember my dad. Oh, that's gorgeous. Yeah, lovely. This emerging wine region is where you'll find plenty of boutique wine pioneers, just like Tim from Allegiance Wines. Not only does Tim look after an excellent winery, it's also a fantastic place to visit and relax. So Tim, your property is a beautiful style. Can you tell me a little bit more about the, the history of that? Absolutely. It was built by a local family who'd been in the Manus Valley for years mm -hmm. and world famous uh, sheep and wool farmers and uh, their dream was uh, to build a Tuscan style villa. So they used to holiday in Tuscany and loved mm -hmm. it. Um, so around the 2007 mark, uh, they put in the vines and the house and everything was done in that Tuscan style. Uh, so inside you see the big uh, high ceilings and the timber beams mm -hmm. and the colour schemes and the indoor outdoor uh, areas as well. Um, and they had a reasonably large family, so it ended up being the five bedrooms. So when we put it onto Airbnb, um, probably the, the most common group size we get are four couples and four to six kids mm -hmm. because of the bunk room. And um, we get lots of great events like 70ths and 50th wedding anniversaries and those types of things where, yeah. where people being the location of Tumbarumba being halfway between Sydney and Melbourne, uh, it's great if the families are split and mm -hmm. they want somewhere central yeah. where they can have the whole property in the romantic surrounds of a vineyard. Uh, we've got the dam out the front yep. with the fish and bird fish. life. Mm -hmm. Well, the fish that will come out eventually. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, the, that side of the um, vineyard has really taken off and uh, it wasn't in our original plans. Okay. Um, it was all about the fruit, mm -hmm. but being able to share the property throughout the year um, with guests has been fantastic. It seems to be just as popular in winter. People want to come to the mountains to experience mm -hmm. uh, what it's like in the snowies in winter. And by the same token, in summer, we have crazy people swimming in the dam. So <laughs> depends on the season. Lovely. It has been a wonderful day here at Allegiance Wines chatting to Tim about the history of the property and the gorgeous wines that he makes here. The crew and I are very fortunate to be able to stay here this evening in his lovely accommodation, so I am about to tuck in with a glass of his finest and a charcuterie board. Cheers. Just a short trip across the valley and we're off to visit one of Tumbarumba's other wine icons. Kurabira Wines was first established in 1993 and is run by the incredible Cathy Gann, who I'm lucky enough to be able to catch up with today. Cathy, thank you so much for having us at Kurabira Wines. You have a fabulous property here and an even better story behind it. Can you tell me a little bit about how you ended up here? Uh, how we, we were bike riders from Melbourne. Mm -hmm. uh, my husband's into the gym scene, and yep. so we decided to come on a holiday going up to Newcastle. We spent one night in Tumbarumba, just next door, in a little old cottage. Beautiful weather here, and then we went up to our holiday up in Newcastle. It poured with rain, we couldn't get on our bikes, and we thought we're coming back. <laughs> so we spent the rest of our holiday here, and, uh, and then we went home to Melbourne. We quit our jobs and we moved up, and we just moved across the road 
In the little cottage, we paid $40 a week for 550 acres. Gosh. But we did used to shoot the rats that were running around the house with a rifle, sometimes with the sights on. It was, um, yeah, interesting times. It was wonderful. So, Kathy, can you tell me a little bit more about this region that we're in? Yeah, so the Tumbrumba Wine region, which is um, goes just a bit north of us and goes right down to the Victorian border. Mm -hmm. So originally, um, once it sort of got under production, there was about 17 vineyards. We got up to about 33, now we're back to about 16. So it started back in the early 80s and the vineyard just down the road, it's actually owned by my brother. That was the first vineyard put in the region. Okay. He bought it in 2010. Yep. It was a sparkling region, so Seppels and South Corp were the sort of founders of this region, if you, if you like to say, um, and they wanted sparkling fruit. Mm -hmm. So everybody put Chardonnay Pinot Noir in. We also did Pinot Meunier, which is a, a French kind that they use in sparkling. Um, and it's, so it then grew into table wines. Their sparkling sort of fell off the popularity for consumers from quite a while back, but now it's back. Yay. Um, sparkling is the way to go. Love a sparkling. Um, yes, everyone loves a sparkling. <laughs> Why not drink bubble? That's yes. it. So the region, um, we're all on different soil types. Right. Mm -hmm. Very high rainfall. We're on granite, mm -hmm. but just down the road they're on basalt soil. So we have very different styles, but it's a very, we're the coldest wine growing region on mainland Australia. Yeah. And so we have very high acidity and very clean, crisp, elegant fruit. That you knew it at the time, but can you give me a bit of the indigenous history of Kurabira? Yeah, so when we like started our wine brand, always trying to think of a name, you know, mm -hmm. you think, do how do you call it? What will people remember? And the lady that crossed the road was born and bred here, and she always said to me, if you don't call it Kurabira, I will not be remembered. So I decided, thinking, well, Kurabira, it's pretty hard, I'll do a bit of research. Mm -hmm. And then we found out that it meant Pleasant Place Family Gathering in Aboriginal um, from the Nagario peoples. Mm -hmm. And so we thought, perfect, because I'm one of 11 children. So we always have family gatherings and it's always a meeting place for lots of my family members. Yeah. So it was perfect for us. Um, yeah, and we had a Japanese uh, artist. Uh, he was an, a graphic artist mm -hmm. come and he's a friend of my daughter's. He said, I oh, will do your design. And he came up with our logo and everything was wonderful. Fabulous. One of 11. That is One fantastic. Of 11. Yes. So you have family come back and work with you, for you all the time, passing yeah, through? Yeah, over the time. Well, we came here in 83 yep. and over the years we've had seven of them move up here for like five years, 10 years, 12 years and then move on and come back. And my brother Kevin is with us. He's been here for 12 months now and he's been an absolute gem. He's the baby he's of the, the family. Baby, yep. baby. Mm -hmm. yes, and uh, always a spoiled one. And yeah. now the significance um, of your logo, then you have obviously one circle for each of your siblings. Yeah, so and the how... logo is that I am the centre because the world revolves around me. Mm -hmm. Well, that's how it started. And each one of our dots represents a family member. So I've got 10 siblings and they've all got their own colour dot and their own wine. Great, yeah. and that correlates to the wine. Each, yes, it does. Each vintage, yeah? Yes, yes, yeah. So that's um, been part of the story and people love it. People, yeah. when they come here, and it, it's amazing how many people come here that have got uh, uh, 10 siblings. And they buy, like people buy the range, one of each, or yep. they buy their dot or whatever. It's really mm -hmm. quite amazing. They're all that older bracket because um, people don't have 11 children anymore. No. But uh, yeah, it's quite Oh, fun. that's fantastic. Yeah. So we have um, 20 acres under grapes. Mm -hmm. So we've got different varieties. We certainly started with only sparkling back in the early days because that's what the companies were after. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've grafted over to table wine. So all of the wines on there are estate grown um, and we've just grafted over some, but we have we produce around 80 tonne a year and most of it we were well now, we're at about 50% of our own production and 50% sold off yeah, right. to other companies. But um, hopefully we'll be 100% our own production soon. Yeah. yeah. So Kathy, can you tell us a little bit about the wine we're drinking right now? So we're drinking the 2016 Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing about this region is wines hold very well. We've got good acidity, so the wines will age and they always get better and more have more finesse as they get a bit okay. older. So, you know, to drink a really young Chardonnay um, is to some people's taste, but we like to leave them in yeah. bottle for a few years before we release. And mm -hmm. I think they have a much softer palate Lovely. and uh, very fruity. 
At least if you have a try. Mm -hmm. But they're very elegant. Mm. That's delicious. It's very smooth. <laughs> so yes. nice. Now, I do believe we're going to taste a few other wines inside today. Is that correct? That is correct. Should yes. we head on in? Cheers. There's more than just delicious wines on offer here at Korobira. Spread across the property are several impressive art installations, and I'm about to check out one of the biggest. As part of the Snowy Valley's sculpture trail, Korobira has two installations on the property. Thinking Red by Japanese artist Haruyuki Uchiba is a moving piece made of stainless steel and magnets. And there is also an egg whisk hanging from a tree. The Snowy Valley Sculpture Trail stretches along the local vineyards and features some brilliant and unique sculptures. See, I told you there was a giant egg whisk. Time to get in from the cold, and Kurabira's cellar door is the perfect place to be. Looks like I'm not alone. It's days like today that make it easy to forget I've got a job to do. I mean, I could very easily lose track of time here. Speaking of time, it's time to taste some more wine. So this is an Austrian grape variety. Mm -hmm. And the Adelaide Hills Society brought that into the country um, with permission and through all the procedures. So we sign a clause to say we won't propagate or sell this off as buying material to anybody mm -hmm. else. So it's quite a protected little species and not too much of it grown in New South Wales at all. But in Austria, this is what they would drink as their table wine. In Germany, you would drink a Riesling. So that's sort of how it is. Yeah. And it's quite nashy pear, very citrusy, it's very floral. So this is a, a new vintage, 2022. If you remember my family dot, yes, this is my baby brother Kevin. So uh -huh. this is his wine, the Pinot Noir Rosé. And this one we did because of the bushfires. We couldn't, um, we didn't have much Pinot Noir fruit left at all, mm -hmm. or we had nothing on that year. But the year after, we only had a tiny bit of Pinot Noir, and we'd run out of stock. So we decided to make this wine so we could bottle and produce in the same year. Yeah, whereas normally a Pinot Noir we um, don't bottle for 12 months later. Mm -hmm. So we had that because we'd run out of stock and it's been extremely popular. So it's quite strawberry um, and mm. still very fresh. So we always serve this one with like with the cheese platters, the plowman's yep. um, gnocchi. Mm -hmm. So we do our own gnocchi. So those sorts of things, it goes really, really well with. I've never tasted a Pinot Meunier before, so it was a real treat to have Cathy open one for us. So Meunier means hairy, which is quite strange, but it gets a beautiful pink bloom on the leaves when it's growing mm -hmm. and the fruit. So it's a very um, 
unique sort of flavour and not a lot of people grow it at all. So it's used a lot in sparkling in France, but not too much in Australia. Tasmania do, yep. but not too much. So you can sort of, can you taste that difference? Very spicy. Very spicy, I like that, mm, but so light. It is still light, mm. quite alcoholic though. So. Another one. Yes, we like high alcohol. <laughs> no, we don't. We don't normally. They're not they're quite low, but. Um, and then the last one mm -hmm. is the Pinot Noir. So this is a 2021 vintage, so mm -hmm. it's quite um, light, it's very bright, and it's a very elegant wine. Um, thing about Pinot Noir, what we've learnt in this region is we need to pick them young, uh, like at a low bome and fresh, so that it stays fresh and very fruity, rather than the old way where they used to pick them quite ripe uh -huh. and they'd get quite jammy and um, heavy because we're trying to sort of emulate what they did in other wine regions. But we've learnt now over the years that Tumbrumba needs to have a low, um, a lower bome, so mm -hmm. the fruit is still ripe and balanced, but the sugar levels are low, yep. which are a little bit lower in alcohol. Nice one. Drink two of these. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mind if I do. Thanks, Kathy. It's almost time to head home, but I think there's still room for one last drink with Tim back at Allegiance Wines. You! <laughs> Beautiful. There we go. Nearly made the dam. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, Tim. Nice one. Mm. It's been an awesome few days in the Tumba Rumba wine region known for its cool climate wines, and I can see why. Thanks for watching The Salador. Until next time, cheers. <laughs>